Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> so we'll pick back up. Um, there's my uh, Twitter address if anyone wants to wants to follow me here. Um, search and optimization: the process of improving the visibility of a website in the organic section of search engine results uh, for relevant search terms. Uh, if we look at a search engine results page here, you'll notice the first two results have the little um, orange or yellow ad tag. Um, so that's Google's uh, AdWords program. So those are paid ads. And then the organic section is really everything else that's below that. Um, and the organic section is really what, what we're looking to uh, improve visibility on within SEO. And that's dictated by you know 200 plus factors um, within Google's algorithm that really is just meant to determine who is the you know, best results, what is the best web page um, versus the query uh, that was entered in the, the search box. Um, so the three primary focus areas of SEO um, that we're going to cover today, uh, on-page SEO, off-page SEO, and then crawl health. So on-page SEO is going to be everything that we're doing to um, the actual website itself, right? So this is you know, what pages do we have? What is the structure of the website? You know, what are those pages about? Uh, what is the content on those pages? Uh, is it text, video, images? Um, you know, how are we optimizing the um, text content uh, and video and images uh, on the web pages? Uh, and then off-page SEO is uh, synonymous with link building, um, but there are other uh, elements that are also included within off-page SEO, so social media, Social media is part of uh, off-page SEO. Really, anything that we're doing um, out on the internet, not on the site itself, uh, to promote uh, our website would be considered off-page SEO. And then kind of the last area is crawl health. And this is really more the technical side of SEO. Um, and, and what we're looking at when we're trying to improve crawl health of a site is uh, eliminating errors that can um, create problems for Googlebot or other search engine bots when they want to come and call a site. So this can be things like broken links, it can be duplicate content, uh, misconfigured metadata. Um, you can have things like uh, your robots.txt file is a file that will you know, restrict access to certain parts of your website. Um, things like uh, checkout and cart and um, other areas that you don't want indexed. So all that is kind of uh, involved in, in the call health uh, for SEO. So um, this is the periodic table of SEO success factors. Okay, and uh, this is an infographic that you can you can actually Google this if you do the periodic table of SEO, and you can grab this uh, infographic and it and it breaks down um, what each of these elements are. Uh, but essentially, this is kind of a, a ranking system uh, that is showing all the different ranking factors um, based on some industry information. And if you look, there's in, in each of these little boxes, you've got a score in the upper right-hand corner, so it's, it's placing a value on each one of these things. Uh, on the left, you have on-page SEO, um, we just talked about, and on the right are off-page SEO factors. So there's a lot here. Um, bottom line is if you have, um, whether you are working with an agency or you have an in-house team or you're working with a consultant, uh, whoever that person is needs to be able to understand these factors, um, explain them, and ultimately put this into a cohesive strategy. Um, we're just going to cover, you know, some of the some of the main ones in here um, because this would uh, be its own webinar, just this just this table. Um, so let's start with on-page SEO, and specifically, we're talking about content. Um, content can be written content, uh, it can be video, it can be images, um, infographics, um, interactive uh, elements. Um, when, we, when we talk about the quality uh, of content, um, we are talking about, you know, if it's text, you know, how well the text is written, you know, do we have uh, misspellings and errors, you know, are we, are we using the proper terminology uh, within a particular vertical? Um, Google can kind of, you know, gauge those things out. Um, you know, Google can tell the reading level um, of different written content, um, so you want to make sure that you know, written content that you have is very well done. You know, same for, for video or images. You want to make sure that these things are formatted for the web so that they load quickly um, and that they're of a, of a high quality. Um, for text, you know, we generally want to see a certain amount of text uh, on, on any given page. 
Um, we generally say, you know, a bare minimum of 200 words. Um, average is probably 500, and ideal is 1,500 plus. Some of this depends on the page itself, right? Um, because you talk about 1,500 words. Uh, if you look at what that actually looks like on a web page, it is a lot of text. Um, so in order to do this right, you really need to structure that content in the right way. So um, breaking it up into smaller sections uh, with headings so that it's easily uh, able to be digested, um, using things like bulleted lists and, and uh, breaking up that content so it doesn't look like a giant book. Um, so research, uh, we want to make sure that there is research going into the content that you're creating. So you know, if you have something that is industry specific, uh, you want to make sure that you've done your research and you know what you're talking about. Um, Google does have um, some resources now where they are understanding uh, facts, factual information. So if you are trying to be an industry leader out there creating content, you haven't done your research and you're misstating things, um, you know, there's a chance Google's going to be able to, you know, uh, figure that out. Um, on the research side as well, keyword research is critical. Um, not everything is all about keywords today, uh, but it's still a really important part of SEO. Um, and it is identifying the right keywords um, that you want to target on your site uh, that match the intent of the person that you want to connect with. Um, and then lastly, the, the actual keywords, we're talking about keyword usage, right? So if you want to rank for you know, certain keywords, you're, you're going to want to be using that on the page. Um, certainly, there's some strategy around how you do that, so it's user friendly, um, and we're not, you know, doing what's called keyword stuffing. Um, you go back a, a few years, and you could just repeat the same words over and over, and it had a big impact. That's obviously a really poor user experience. Uh, I remember going to those web pages, and it was horrible. Um, so, at the end of the day, you do want to use your keywords within the text, within the heading, within your page content. You want it to be natural, and it needs to read natural. Um, if we do a good job and we're ranking for keywords that we want to rank for, but then when people get there, they're having a horrible experience, uh, they're not going to convert. So they're not going to convert into a sale or a web lead or whatever we're looking uh, for them to do. Um, so there's some tools that we can look at here for on-page SEO. Um, we use these tools uh, here, and we also use some more expensive, kind of more advanced tools. I wanted to focus on these for the webinar just because these are pretty inexpensive. Um, low barrier to entry, so if you're doing some stuff in-house, you know, these are pretty affordable uh, software packages. Um, if, you, if you have a, a more, you know, uh, in-depth team in-house um, or you're working with an agency, then there's, there's some more advanced tools. Um, SEMrush is a great tool for keyword research. Uh, Google Keyword Planner is Google's keyword research tool that they've created for the AdWords or their paid platform. The tool is free to use, but you have to use a credit card to set it up. Um, I think they do that just to scare people away um, so they're not, not using it as much. Um, Moz is another great tool set, and they have a keyword difficulty tool uh, where you can drop in keywords and it assigns a score to those keywords based on how difficult it is to rank for those keywords, uh, and they base that on, on backlink data. And then SEO Book uh, has a free tool um, for keyword density. Um, you know, like I mentioned, keyword, keyword density um, it's really just a guide, right? So we don't want to get hung up on, hey, you know, we need to have, you know, 4% keyword density on our keywords in the page content. Uh, at the same time, we still use that to get an idea for what the keyword density looks like on a particular page. Um, it, part of that is to make sure that we're not overdoing it as well. Uh, we, we generally do aim for around 2 to 4% uh, keyword density. So this is a screenshot from SEMrush. Um, you can see at the top of this you can, where you can drop in a site, and this is a really useful tool uh, in that it will give us a snapshot of the keyword that a particular site is ranking for. So it won't tell us everything, but you know, if you say you already have a website that you've developed, you haven't done any SEO, but the site's been around, it's indexed, um, chances are you're ranking for something. You may not be ranking for the terms that you want to rank for, but there may be something there that, you know, uh, just by chance you're, you're ranking well for. It's really important that as you begin to put together an SEO strategy that you recognize that. Because um, what can happen is if you don't know what you're already ranking for, then you may go in and make changes and lose uh, those rankings. Um, so SEMrush is a, is a great tool for that. 
Uh, this is a screenshot from Google um, Keyword Planner. Um, we do, you know, when we do our keyword research, we are using a number of different programs and we're doing a lot of work within Excel and a lot of data parsing and organizing and creating keyword groups. Once we have a lot of that done, you know, that's really where we're coming into Keyword Planner. If you're trying to do this in-house and, you know, you don't, you don't have a team or an agency, um, you can probably just work within Keyword Planner and at least you can get volume here. Um, so you see the average monthly searches. These are all keyword groups that you see in front of you. You can open those up within this program and it'll show you the actual keywords um, that are uh, associated with each of those keyword groups. And then, you know, this tool will allow you to kind of add that to a plan and then you can expo export it to Excel. Um, the trick when you're doing keyword research, one of the big things is not going after terms that are too competitive. Um, so it's easy to go in and say, okay, well, ski boots, yep, that looks like a great term. Um, but you need to be strategic on what you're actually targeting. You know, if you were going to start a uh, sneaker company, you don't want to try to rank for tennis shoes. You know, you're going to be competing with Nike. So it's important you're going after terms that kind of hit the sweet spot of opportunity, but also a low enough competition that you, it's realistic to be able to rank for those terms. Uh, this is Moz's keyword difficulty tool. Um, up in the upper left is the keyword that we've entered. Um, and each one of these, bar, uh, these uh, orange and blue bars, each one of those are the uh, websites that rank for this term. So you have it from one is on top down to number 10. And it's really showing the domain authority, um, so uh, the authority of the website and then the authority of the actual page. Um, authority is one of uh, Moz's main metrics. Um, it's kind of like synonymous with, with page rank, if, if uh, anyone's ever heard of that. Um, but this is a metric that's actually updated and, and fairly useful. This is all based, these scores are all based on backlink profile. Um, so on-page factors are not uh, coming in here. Um, but this will give you an idea. So you see this term, if you look in the upper right, the difficulty score is 54, so it's highly competitive. Um, you know, you would want to make sure that if you're going to try to r rank for this term, you would want to go look at the domain and page authority of your website and see if those numbers kind of match up, you know, are you in the ballpark? Um, if I tell you whether or not you can rank for it for sure, but at least it'll, it'll give you a little bit of guidance to whether or not you're trying to rank for something that's never going to happen or isn't going to happen anytime soon. Uh, so super useful tool there. Um, this is the results from that SEO book, uh, Keyword Density. And you can kind of see this is actually ours, uh, our website. Um, SEO, you see up there in the upper left, that first, um, First term, 6.71, that's actually a little high, so we'll probably want to do some tweaks to bring that down. Um, and this just gives us an idea. So for one word, two word, and three word phrases, what our density is on a page. Um, free tool to use, it's a great guide. Uh, as I mentioned, we try to aim somewhere between two and four percent for our keywords. Uh, we want to use them on the page in a way that makes sense, it's natural. Use the keywords within the heading, uh, within the each of the sections. And then we really, like I said, use this tool to make sure that we're not going over and um, overdoing things. So let's look at, let's talk about on-page SEO on the HTML side, on the code side. So um, these are some of the main factors uh, within the HTML code uh, that influences SEO. So the page title is the first thing, uh, the meta description, uh, the actual structure and markup um, of the HTML, and then linked resources. So if you look at the ad, um, the listing for Evo there to the right, skis and ski gear, best deals, plus free shipping. So that's their page title. Um, you want to make sure you've got a unique title on every single page uh, on your site and that you're using your keyword. Um, you know, when we go in and we do uh, in, in on-page SEO strategy, we're mapping keywords in a very specific way and we're constructing these titles in a very specific way. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to just do this in-house on your own, you know, the main thing is that you're not trying to target the exact same keywords on multiple pages um, and that you're, you know, you're, you're following some basic formatting guidelines. Um, there is a cheat sheet I'm going to share here in a minute that you can um, download online that will give you some of the basic formatting to follow. Um, the description that you see below in black, everything you need, these boots, that's the meta description. Um, this is really more about click-through rate than it is SEO. 
Uh, it is good to use your keywords in there, but it's not as much a factor as you know people once believed. That's more about getting people to click through. So if you rank, if you do well over time and you're ranking for the keywords that you care about, it's important that you've got a solid message that elicits a click through from the user. Um, you know, those rankings and that visibility is pretty worthless if no one actually clicks through to your site. Um, structure and markup, we're really talking about, you know, the heading tag structure on a page, like within the text. So you typically don't want to have more than one H1 on a page. Uh, the H1, that heading tag, is the main topic um, for a particular web page. And then you use the additional heading tags, H2s, H3s, uh, so on and so forth, to break down that content. So if our H1 was snowboard, then you know you might have um, H2s that are you know uh, top rated snowboards, um, you know uh, newest snowboard companies, and and you use that those heading tags to kind of break it break break up that content um, as you go down the page. Um, linked resources that, that's another important one, right? So um, it is actually good to link out within your content. Um, as a credibility factor. So if we're trying to write a piece that's on, you know, modern snowboard construction and some of the materials, um, you can, you have expertly written content, but you also want to link out to other authoritative sources. It's kind of like your basic uh, journalism, right? So it's almost like citing your sources. Um, this is really good when you get into blogs and, and creating content there. If you have something that you think is industry leading and you want it to have some legs, then you want to make sure you did your research, you know what other leaders have, have said about this, and you're kind of critiquing it and, and coming with your own angle. Um, so it's good to mention uh, those other people and link out to those resources um, within your text content. Some of these, when you're like, you know, looking at e-commerce, um, it, it can be tricky, right? I mean, you don't want to be sending people out away from your web pages. Um, so you, 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 know, you, have to, you have to gauge this out and see if it makes sense where you can, if you can link out to credible resources, it, it does help. Um, so let's look at on-page SEO. These are some of the tools that you can use uh, on the HTML side to help. So the first one is the SEO Web Developers Cheat Sheet. Um, I'll show you a screenshot of that in a second, but you can Google that, and that's a PDF you can download. You know, that'll kind of show you the basic structure around titles, meta description, um, you know, in terms of uh, link text uh, or link codes. Um, a lot of that is on there. Uh, Moz has an on-page grader that you can go ahead and, and put in um, a particular page and it will, you know, kind of run through and say, okay, did you use the keyword in the title? Did you use the meta description? Is it in your heading tag? Um, and it just, it's a pretty good uh, starting point if you're trying to do stuff, you know, in-house or, or on your own. And then obviously there's some crossover there with, you know, content as opposed to uh, HTML. Uh, and then SEMrush uh, has a site audit. And you're really kind of getting into the crawl health, um, but SEMrush does, uh, you know, check the HTML and it'll look for errors. So say we've got, you know, duplicate page title that somehow are going out across a bunch of pages, you know, a site audit will be able to pick that up and then you can figure out where you need to uh, update those titles. Um, this is that cheat sheet from Mont. That's the web developer's cheat sheet. And you can see in there it's giving you, you know, some characters. Um, uh, some links to follow, and there's a lot of other good, this is actually, I think, a three-page PDF, so there's a lot of good information on there. Um, so if you're, if you're doing this stuff on your own, it's probably a good, uh, uh, a good tool to have. Um, this is a result from SEMrush from a site audit. Um, we use SEMrush, and as I mentioned, we've got, you know, I think we've got actually three other crawl tools that we use. SEMrush is, is you know, I like it because the user interface is pretty solid. It's it's pretty inexpensive. I think their starting program is like seventy nine bucks a month or something. So um, it's pretty manageable. Um, so you can see there's a score right there, sixty two percent. That's out of a hundred. Um, so you know, this is definitely something that you would want to uh, address. There's obviously uh, a lot of errors. Um, this tool breaks down into errors, warnings, and notices. Errors are the most severe. Warnings are kind of secondary, and notices are uh, kind of neutral things that you just need to look into. Um, we run these every single month for our clients, and we keep track of those errors. So the goal is that you get all these errors and warnings down um, to really, you know, single digits. Um, and you know, it can take time, especially with an enterprise site. You know, obviously here, if we've got 96,000 warnings, 
it's not practical to say, hey, well, we're going to go in and, and attack these one by one, right? So it's one of the things that separates enterprise SEO from other types of um, SEO management in that we have to create solutions that can scale out where we can have a fix that will go in and address, you know, 20,000 errors in, in, in one fell swoop. Um, and it can be pretty challenging, but, um, you know, that's the idea. Here's some specific errors, and um, I won't spend too much time here, but these are errors that uh, relate back with the previous summary screen. So you can see this particular site, uh, 17,998 pages have duplicate content. Um, yeah, this, this particular site is in not good shape. Um, if you've got duplicate content out there that is truly duplicate, Google does not want to be showing those pages in search. Um, they want one version of any given page to serve up to users. If you somehow are spinning out, you know, hundreds of extra pages that are duplicate, you are uh, hurting the value of those pages, um, you know, and you can even get into issues with, with penalties, um, you know, just for duplicate content. Uh, duplicate title tags, that's another pretty big issue. You know, your title tag is telling Google what a particular page is about, um, and if you've got duplicate metadata, like title tags and meta descriptions, then you're essentially telling Google that those pages are the same. Um, if they really are the same, then there's some things you need to do to address those. So we don't want, you know, uh, a lot of duplicate pages being indexed. If we do have duplicate pages for whatever reason, maybe, you know, the CMS or, um, you know, your system is creating these extra pages on the, on the back end for a legitimate reason, we want to go in and no index, no follow those pages, which is a code that we can add to make sure that Google understands they're not supposed to index those pages. Um, we also, if we have duplicate pages, you know, um, want to redirect those duplicate pages to the source page. Uh, 301 redirects would be your actually your best solution um, for redirecting duplicate content. And then if you really can't do that, um, then you know doing a no index, no follow, um, and even a, a rel canonical. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on here. Uh, off page SEO. So these are some of the main uh, factors with an off page SEO. Um, so link relevance, you know, if you go back a few years, it really was all about volume of links. And, you know, there were guys that, you know, just would, would be managing, you know, um, a large number of websites and someone would come pay them and they just point a bunch of links to, you know, uh, their customer site and they would just shoot up in the rankings. Um, that, was a, that was a different time. <laughs> that changed quite a bit to where now it's not about volume. Uh, yes, Google cares about the number of links that you have coming in. Um, but it is really about relevance, right? So if, if I want to rank for SEO terms, then I'm going to need to get links from, you know, SEO sites, marketing websites, you know, maybe articles I've written that are on SEO. What I don't want is a link from a construction directory or from a random blog where there's, you know, just dropped a link in as spam. Uh, Google's become really good at, at figuring out if a site is relevant or not. And if you got links from irrelevant pages, you know, by and large, they're just not going to offer a lot of benefit. Worst case scenario is it can, it can land you in a penalty. Um, so you just kind of got to use your judgment there. Um, trust versus authority or power. So we talked about authority with Moz, and that really is like the um, authoritativeness of a site. So sites that have been around a really long time, uh, have a lot of links, have links from big, you know, authoritative sites. Uh, other sites, uh, maybe organizations or news sites, that's going to increase your authority. Uh, trust is really um, another metric. Uh, Link Research Tools is another um, tool set that we use, and, and they have a trust uh, metric. So does Moz. And it is just what it sounds like. So uh, yes, you've got a bunch of authoritative links. What do you have in terms of links um, that are trusted? So these, again, these could be like .gov, they could be .org, uh, they could be news sites, but highly trusted sites. Um, when we go in and look at a particular client's backlink profile, one of the things that we're looking for is, you know, are they at risk for a penalty? And if we see that the authority and power is much higher than trust, that can be a flag, right? Because that tells us that there's been, you know, probably a bunch of links that are built, but not necessarily a lot of uh, trust, trusted links. Um, so uh, it's, you definitely have to pay attention to that. Um, Paid links are generally bad, right? <laughs> Google's been pretty vocal about this. Um, if you go anywhere and you're seeing, you know, hey, buy these links here, you know, 
two hundred high page rank links for sixty nine ninety nine. All that stuff uh, is really dangerous, and it can land you in a penalty really quick. So stay away from paid links altogether. If if there's anything that has to do with links that you're finding online, and they're talking about page rank, that's a flag because that that's the terminology that. People in the SEO industry don't use PageRank anymore. It's not a good metric, and it's, it's not really being updated anymore. Um, but those in kind of the spammier sector, you know, that's that's what they're selling is they're talking about PageRank. Um, there is a gray area here, and that's you may have a you know a um, a site that you want to say get a guest blog published on, and they may charge an editorial fee for their time to review your blog post. Um, you also have some paid directories out there um, that aren't that aren't bad. So that that's kind of the gray area. Really, what you have to look at is: Are they saying that you're buying the link, or technically, are you paying for something related to processing that link? And I, it's a fine line, but you have to be really careful. Anything where you know people are advertising selling links, you want to stay away from. Um, anchor text. So if you look at a you know a blog post and it's about you know, uh, snowboarding, and the actual link within the text, um, the actual word that is a link within that text is the anchor text, and it sends a very strong signal to Google regarding what that web page is about. Um, this has been abused in the past, and it used to be, you know, a way that um, you know uh, SEO providers would increase rankings. They would build a lot of links. With very specific anchor text um, in the keywords that we wanted to, to rank for. So if I want to rank for for SEO, then I'm building a bunch of links in various places with the text SEO that links back to my site. Um, in general, if you're doing this stuff in house, if you're not working with a consultant, I would stay clear away from doing anything with anchor text. Your anchor text should be your branding. It should be your website. Uh, click here, submit. You know, those are the kinds of uh, anchor text that are more natural. And that's probably what I would do. Um, stay away from trying to get strategic with anchor text. It's a it's a really easy way to land yourself in a penalty with Google. Um, link profile toxicity. So you know one thing that we're doing with every one of our clients when we do an initial audit, um, or at least when we get into actually kind of stage two of our um, of our research process at the beginning, we will run a toxic link analysis on a site, and we're just looking to see you know what is the um, Link toxicity. So, are there a lot of bad, nasty, spammy links pointing to the site? Maybe did this uh, did this client maybe you know accidentally kind of get into some spammy, shady SEO? You know, maybe they hired someone and didn't know what they were doing, or maybe they signed up for one of these link schemes. Um, it's important to to understand if you're at risk um, because if you've got a site with a lot of organic traffic and you are not doing anything to monitor toxic links. You could inadvertently get penalized without have uh, without having uh, really done anything, right? And negative SEO is something that is very real today. As uh, Google has um, tweaked its algorithm over time, um, negative SEO has become more of a factor. So what that means is, is you may have a competitor that is just kind of shady and they want to torpedo you, so they go sign up for one of these link buying schemes and point these links to your site. Um, it can land you in a penalty, and there's not a whole lot you can do other than monitor that over time. And then there is a process you follow to to remove those links uh, and get a penalty recovery uh, in process. So off-page SEO tools. Um, yes, these are some good ones. So Open Site Explorer is Moz's tool. Um, it's really easy to use. Uh, I think they have a free version too. You can go in, and it'll show you at least the top links. But you can go in and you can go through your your competitors' backlinks and look at the backlinks that they have uh, to try to look for opportunities. You can go through and explore your own backlinks. Moz does have kind of a spam score now, which is pretty cool. Um, link research tools is a little bit more expensive tool set. We've got one of their more uh, expensive software options, uh, but it's a really powerful tool set. Um, again, I mean, at, at link research tools. Um, you know, most of what you're going to be doing in there is going to require a pretty high level of expertise. Uh, there's a lot of data and a lot of uh, metrics that you're looking at. Um, but if you have, if you are building an in-house team over time, Link Research Tools is a is a phenomenal tool set. Uh, link Detox is a particular tool within re Link uh, Research Tool, 
and you can pay per use, um, which is awesome, right? Because link research tools isn't isn't that cheap. Um, but if you want to run a link detox on your site, that you can pay for that, you know, one time, and then you can see how things look. And uh, you know, if you're in really bad shape, then you can get in touch with somebody um, to try to, you know, kind of walk you through the process of uh, of dealing with those toxic links. Um, so this is yeah, this is a link detox results page from uh, Link Research Tools, and you can kind of see the metrics we talked about before. So you can see um, there's a power trust score, which is really just power times trust. We have power up there before, and trust of five. So overall, the trust looks good on this, but when you go down and look at that uh, Link Detox score, it's pretty bad. Um, so anything that's in the red, where you see that, you know that. Uh, that graphic kind of filled out to the right. Um, this is this is bad news, right? So if this was a client that we were taking on, we would need to do a toxic link assessment. And what that means is that we're going into the the data behind this report and going in and analyzing each of these links one by one. Um, really important thing here: if you are, you know, you need to be very careful doing any of this stuff in house without someone um, kind of guiding you. Um, when we go through and we're assessing these, we have to set up a kind of a remote machine on our computers to protect uh, our machines from viruses. Because a lot of these links um, can be, you know, web pages that have malware and viruses and some really nasty stuff. So um, even going in and visiting the site within this report can be dangerous. Um, so you just you just want to be very careful. Uh, this is some of the more technical aspects of SEO, and you want to make sure that you have you know, some, some strong guidance either. Um, someone in-house has been doing it for a very long time or you need to be working with a consultant or, or an agency that knows what they're doing. Um, okay, so let's talk about crawl health. You know, some of the some of the things that we're looking for in crawl health, broken links. These can be internal broken links. Um, they can be, you know, if we have links that are maybe indexed by Google, maybe you have a page that used to exist on your site but it got deleted. Um, that would produce a 404 error, that, that page not found. Um, you know, those are things that we want to deal with. If we've got a lot of internal broken links and a lot of 404 errors, you know, essentially we're putting up roadblocks that's keeping Google from properly crawling and indexing our content. Uh, Google has, you know, um, I don't know how many million websites has got to go crawl, but it's not going to spend in, um, you know, unlimited amount of time on any given website. So if it comes into your site and it's running into errors left and right, at some point it's just going to it's going to they're going to leave. You know, they're going to say, "Well, this is too much work. Obviously, this site is broken. We're going to move on." Um, speed uh, is a Google ranking factor, right? So how fast do your web pages load? It's particularly relevant when it comes to mobile. Um, people are a little bit more fickle on mobile devices. Um, so if you're not, you know, if you don't have good speed on mobile, that can hurt your mobile ranking. And then mobile optimization too, right? So there's, you know, Google does have a free uh, mobile-friendly test that you can run. It's a really just kind of high-level, simple pass-fail test. Um, most modern sites now are going to be responsive or going to be developed for mobile. Beyond that pass-fail test, um, you can set up a Google Search Console, um, or what was formerly called Webmaster Tools. And within Search Console, once you have that set up, you can go in on a much more granular level and look at um, particular um, issues on mobile devices, and it'll point out pages and what the particular issues are, so that you can really optimize for uh, mobile pass, uh, kind of a high level pass fail. Um, so here's some tools uh, for crawl health. We I kind of already showed you the SEM Rush. Um, I really like their site audit. Moz also has a crawl report. Um, I don't think I'm not a big a fan as, as, uh, of the UI, um, the user interface on it. Uh, I think for most of those, you have to export in Excel and then kind of go through and sort in order to identify, but it's always good to have a, a backup crawl. Uh, Google Search Console, I just mentioned, that's Webmaster Tools. That is free, and it's really easy to set up. If you have a site that, that you're managing, you definitely want Google Search Console set up. This is going to be one of the areas where Google can communicate directly with you. So if your site has been hacked, or maybe you've got a lot of 404 page not found errors, Google Search Console is where you're going to be able to get that information, um, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, and, and it's really easy to set up. It's just a, you know, a code snippet that you're dropping on your homepage, 
and then once you do that, you can you can confirm it, um, and then you'll have access. If you get in a penalty, if it's a manual penalty, this is one of the places where you would get information on that penalty. Uh, Google Speed Test, you can just Google that. Um, that's a free tool. Um, another one that we use that's really good is GT Metrics. Um, actually, it's a little bit better than Google Speed Test, but um, so Google Speed Test and GT Metrics is the other uh, speed test. Those are both free. And then Google Mobile Friendly Test, you can Google that. That's the pass fail um, test. Okay, so this is a screenshot from within uh, Google Search Console or former, formerly Webmaster Tools. Um, there's a lot of information in here, so it's it's worth getting this set up if you don't have it. You know, go through, do your research. I, you know, make sure you understand what's going on back here. Um, the the tab that we're set on here in this screenshot is the 404 errors. Um, this, if you're trying to identify 404 errors, um, Google Search Console is the place to get that information. Some of these other crawl tools can pick it up too, but um, from my experience, uh, Google Search Console gives the most amount of information. Um, so we're going in every month and downloading all these and then figuring out a plan to you know, um, get 301 redirects in place for all of those page not found errors. Um, you don't want this. Obviously, you can see this particular site looks like it had a big spike um, a little while back. Uh, you really want to get these um, errors taken care of. One, it makes your site seem broken to Google, but beyond that, when you have a page that has been deleted, any like authority or, or any kind of link juice that you have on that page, you lose once it's gone. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you have those forwarded to um, a proper place on your uh, on your website that's functioning in live. Um, this is the page speed insights. So this is Google's free tool. Um, you can see we have uh, Burton site. This was back in SIA when I pulled this, so this may be different now. But on mobile, you know, they're they're scoring a 51 out of 100. Um, I would be super concerned about that because that's pretty low. Um, I really want to see stuff up, you know, 70 or above on these. And then it actually gives you some pretty specific direction here, which is pretty cool uh, in terms of the things that you can do to fix this. So then you can work with your web developer to get some of these fixes in place. Um, and you see there's a tab for mobile and then we'll have another um, another tab up there for desktop. And typically um, mobile is uh, kind of more sensitive to speed. So if, if we have a uh, speed of 51 here on mobile, I would expect desktop to be up above this. Um, the bar is just set a little bit differently for the two. Um, this is Google's mobile friendly test. Again, this is that pass fail. It's it's really easy to use. You can Google this and uh, you know put in your website. At this stage, you know it, it's pretty important that your site is mobile friendly. We do have another uh, mobile algorithm update that is coming down the pipeline. Um, so Google announced that we had the, a major one that was about a year ago when they really did start decreasing visibility of um, web pages in mobile search um, for web pages that weren't mobile friendly, which makes sense. Um, you know, if a, if, a, if a site's not configured so it works well on your mobile, Google doesn't want to be showing those pages. Um, so definitely something to be looking at because there's going to be another one coming down the pipeline that's going to further reinforce that. If your site is not mobile friendly and you have a lot of mobile traffic, you know, um, you know it, it could be at risk. It could be in jeopardy. Um, so penalties. Um, so there's so these are kind of the, the two major penalties that are out there, but there's new stuff that comes down the pipeline all the time. So they just had a penalty that um, came through last weekend that was penalizing sites for unnatural outbound links, right? So these are actually bloggers and news sites that were giving out links in exchange for free products and services. Google made an announcement a little while before that that you don't you're not supposed to do that. Um, right for obvious reasons, um, and then they reinforced it um, by issuing manual penalties. And what that looks like is for some of these sites, their site might be de-indexed. Uh, they might lose out their rankings and drop, you know, way out of the uh, first few pages. Um, the two major ones that are out there that that most people have heard of are Penguin and Panda. Penguin is the link penalty, um, and the last major update that we had was back in 2014. Um, we're expecting another one any day now. Um, and this is the one that, you know, by and large, if, if you are doing anything with links uh, in-house, you need to have a consultant or you need to have an agency. You can get yourself in a lot of trouble trying to do link building on your own. 
um, without um, you know without the without the right training. Um, Panda is really the more like the content penalty, and that one is really around like duplicate content, thin content, poor quality content. If you built a website and you know you can't really do this today and get away with it, but what what people were doing is saying, okay, well I want to create a site with you know uh, ten thousand pages but I don't want to pay for content. So I'm just going to go steal content all across the web and I'm going to put those pages up and then I'm going to get traffic and make money. Um, that doesn't work today be, because of this algorithm update, uh, Panda. So if you do have duplicate pages, you can get penalized. Um, at the very least, those pages aren't going to rank in search or they're not going to carry much weight. Uh, so you have to be really careful that you know, you're not copying content from other sites and other pages and that even within your site that you're not duplicating content. Uh, thin content is just, you know, content um, like it sounds, you know, it's, it's less than 200 words. There's just not much um, indexable content for Google to pick up. And poor quality content, you know, stuff that's not written well, um, not put together well, doesn't read well. Um, so, you know, real briefly here, we'll, we'll kind of talking about uh, tracking and analysis. This is uh, essential. <laughs> this is super key. Um, I just uh, had an article published on Huffington Post on the top three SEO KPIs for 2016. Um, if you Google that top three SEO KPIs, uh, 2016, it should come up. Um, but we talk about you know, some of these here. Um, so organic traffic, it's really important to be looking at uh, organic traffic. Thing to consider with organic traffic is also going to include your branded information, right? So um, we want to make sure that when we're optimizing a site, when we're tracking, that yes, we're looking at organic traffic, but we also need to take into account the natural traffic that's going to be generated um, by that client's other marketing efforts, right? So then that kind of takes us to the next um, uh, KPI there, which is LPOV. Um, that's a term that we coined at Colorado SEO Pros a little while back, and it stands for Landing Page Organic Visits. So really what we're looking at is all the pages that we've optimized on the site minus the home page, because the assumption is most of the time, if people are searching for a brand, they're going to come in through the home page uh, as opposed to um, the, the inner pages. So we monitor landing page organic visits every month. That's a metric that if we're doing our job and doing well, should progressively go up over time. And then goals and events can be set up within Google Analytics. And um, you know, it can be as simple as a URL. So you know, a pretty common way to do this is to create a thank you page for a form submission. Um, or you could set up, you know, maybe your checkout page on an e-commerce site. Um, or, you know, really with e-commerce, you can, you can set up much more specific e-commerce tracking uh, within Google Analytics. Um, but ultimately, you know, what is our goal? Yes, we want increased rankings. Uh, yes, we want organic traffic. But at the end of the day, we want conversions, right? So whether that's a sale or a lead form or a phone call, whatever it is, uh, we need to make sure that all the work that we're doing is translating to the bottom line. Um, so that's, that's really where you know, goals and events can help out. And then keyword rank tracking is important. It, it's not the end all be all, but yes, we do care about rankings. And if you're monitoring rankings on a day-to-day -day basis or on a monthly basis and things start to happen, that's a key piece of information in determining uh, what's going on, right? So if we see a sharp drop in, uh, say, uh, organic traffic, we would go look at rankings and say, okay, well, did we lose visibility? Is that what's going on? Uh, if we find out that, no, our rankings actually did not go down, then that, that tells us that we have a different issue on our hand. Maybe, you know, maybe those pages were actually deleted, or maybe there's something else going on that doesn't have to do with the way Google is actually ranking our site. Um, so still important. Um, some reliable SEO resources. Um, it's, it's hard if you're trying to do research on your own for SEO and trying to figure it out. There is a ton of misinformation out there. These are some reliable sources that you can go to. So Search Engine Land, Moz, Search Engine Watch, Search Engine Journal. Um, certainly you can go to our, our website. It's a little antiquated. We're getting ready to, to launch a new one here. If you go to the Advanced Resources section in the footer of our website, it, it has links to these uh, other sites. And then there's also some starter guides and things that we use uh, for training for our interns. So um, feel free to check that out. Um, we also do, you know, if anyone is looking for direct help, we do free uh, site analysis and, and consultation. Uh, we don't work with um, every client. So we are, we're a boutique agency. We're, we're pretty picky about who we work with 
and that really is just to make sure that there's a good fit and that um, you know we've got a solid plan moving forward before we take on any projects. Uh, but I'd be happy to speak with anyone if they're interested in, in having us kind of do an initial audit and um, see if we can we can help with their project. And if anyone is looking for follow-up slides here um, or the video, uh, you can email me. Uh, it's Chris at ColoradoSDOPros.com, uh, and we can we can follow up and provide that.